Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, YWales. My name is Siva Alvaru, Managing Partner of YWale Solutions, and I'm joined by my great friend here, Abe Michael, Head of Ecosystem for YWales. Hey, everybody. We have a great subject for you today. We're going to dive into the depths of gaming uh, with president and co-founder of G3 Gaming, David Moon. David, nice to meet Hi, you. Everyone. Great to meet you. So David, could you could you give us a, a, a just a brief background into what G3 is? Sure, I'd love to. You know, G3 is a company that was inspired to create a platform and to prepare a service that would bring kind of the video game generation to wagering and vice versa. You know, we we noticed that uh, millennials and Gen Z are not watching sports the same way that older generations did, and they're not playing poker or table games or, or slots the same way that other generations have. And so we really wanted to ask ourselves the question, why is that? And is there a way to bring kind of more native experiences, you know, video games per se, to that generation uh, that's now aging into kind of a demographic that's able to enjoy kind of real money experiences? Man, that's super interesting. I mean, you got two millennials here on the call. And I mean, I grew up playing Gran Turismo, Crash Bandicoot, you know, Call of Duty, StarCraft 2, Guild Wars, League of Legends, you name it, right? And I mean, some of the things that G3 is diving into, real money, video gaming, you know, thinking about wagering and thinking about loot boxes and some of these concepts that, you know, a lot of us started to see evolve as these gaming platforms were starting to evolve, right? Especially during the the mid 2000s, the early 2010s. What what is what is real money video gaming and how does that differ from maybe some of the other video games or uh, publishers that are out there, you know, free to earn, free to play, play to earn? And how does that differ from from what we know and understand as traditional gambling? Sure. Well, that's kind of a, a interesting um, uh, topic, right? Maybe I can talk a little bit about my background because, uh, unfortunately, I'm not a millennial, <laughs> and I started in gaming in the late '90s, in 1999. Um, and at the time, I was uh, in Korea writing my dissertation. Mm-hmm. And I was approached by a friend. It was the kind of the beginning of the internet bubble or boot, not bubble, boom in Korea. And uh, there was a startup that did video games. It was called Han Game. And I, I joined that company. And part of the reason I joined or was invited to join was because uh, I and my friend, we played StarCraft against the two founders and we won. <laughs> in like a marathon, oh, right. three oh, hours. Man. I I I hated I hated playing Koreans on StarCraft too. It's, it's it a national a, it sport. Terran Terran Protos versus two Zergs. Oh man, zero so rushes. Like an epic oh, battle, man. and uh, you know, um, we used to joke that StarCraft was the new golf in Korea. But anyway, mm-hmm. yeah. So everyone knows how kind of esports was ahead of the curve, and video game culture was ahead of the curve in Korea. And you know, at, at the company at the time. Uh, we listed in 2002 as NHN Corporation. And, right. uh, you know, one of our key innovations was microtransactions. So you can right. thank, you know, NHN for unleashing the Pandora's box of microtransactions in the world. And we needed to do it because there were only two models at the time, right? There were kind of the, the packaged game, you buy the software on a CD or DVD or whatever, or you did flash games with ads. So long story short, you know, we took that kind of microtransactions model and we were looking at it. And uh, fast forward to today, we have, you know, a plethora of different ways of monetizing and there's app stores, mobile, mobile gaming is huge. And so it's kind of evolved. One thing that we noticed was, um, you know, for uh, online poker and things like that, you know, about 10 years ago, there was kind of Black Monday. Online poker was an unregulated space um, or was operating kind of the gray market and regulators looked at kind of what was going on, the scams that were being run uh, and kind of the money laundering that was happening. And they shut everything down uh, and they brought, you know, iGaming now, uh, you know, online poker, blackjack, slots, et cetera, within the regulatory framework. And really it's taken them about 10 years to build that market back up. So they learned an important lesson there where they want to be ahead of regulations. Um, they kind of uh, learned a similar lesson with their encounter with DraftKings and FanDuel, 
that achieved a certain amount of scale and then duked it out with them in uh, the courts uh, to kind of assert that uh, fantasy sports were not uh, gambling either, that they were skill-based. Mm -hmm. And so state regulators had to find other ways to accommodate the situation. And finally, you know, about five years ago, they, they uh, moved aggressively into online sports book as well. And so what we have now is a situation where when it comes to sports uh, and uh, kind of these specific games called that fall legislatively under the category of iGaming, like poker against pokers and, and slots, um, there's all these wagering models that are available, obviously, in the online space, but none of those models were being applied in a serious way to video games which seemed very strange because uh, the video ga game generation has grown up online with devices in their hand, playing interactive experiences uh, with each other and, you know, uh, against the computer, et cetera. Right. And a lot of the business models in video gaming um, felt very adjacent and similar to uh, uh, wagering models. So, for example, loot crates where or catch upon item systems where you go and you put in some uh, some money and you try to get an item, but it's a blind kind of item where you don't know what's what you're going to get. Uh, you know, that feels very much in some ways like a wagering adjacent experience. Uh, and then a lot of these items end up uh, or ended up having real secondary market value. Right. So World of Warcraft, the gold was being sold in, in these exchanges. People bet in CSGO and, 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 and they wager skins against each other, et cetera. Yeah, um, so a lot of this behavior, we saw it was happening, but it wasn't happening in a regulated way, which meant, first of all, that states and, and, and countries were not uh, taxing it in the right way. Uh, and also um, a lot of these experiences uh, we thought were not necessarily the healthiest for younger uh, video game players and that there would be need to be some way to make sure that uh, uh, these experiences were, were uh, played you know, in, a, in a more healthy way. So in, in iGaming per se or, or online sports book, you see a lot of mechanisms in place that are designed to um, help players be more responsible about their experience. You know, things that limit bets per day or a total amount that you can lose that, you know, that, that people can can set for themselves, but will help them be more responsible. Uh, and most importantly, that keep kids or underage uh, players from actually uh, participating. Well, for us, real money video gaming is kind of uh, the evolution in one sense of the video game market. You know, to make sure that some of these experiences, again, that are, are randomly based, but uh, do provide value and sometimes can even have cash value that these are brought under the rubric of some sort of safe uh, uh, walled garden or in a safe environment. Uh, and at the same time, uh, from the iGaming side and online sports book side of bringing video game experiences into those models as well. Those are great point. That's a great um, insight, David. Um, I think you touched on a, a point that I think is, is really important to highlight here is you know, when you're dealing with real money and you're dealing with um, uh, users of various ages, you know, can you share some insights as far as your your systems and the trustworthiness of the players and the identities that you have within your platform or how you're yeah, absolutely, that? you know, um, again, if you look into the history of uh, kind of the casino space right. and the development of these online expressions of those experiences, you can imagine how important it was for states and regulators to have really concrete controls in place uh, right. from a KYC perspective uh, in terms of being able to look at transactions, sometimes for certain types, even to have real time access to databases, to be able to see behavior, uh, to avoid money laundering, as well as the whole idea of safe gaming and, and you know, the, the industry is developing better and better practices around helping people responsibly game. Um, so, you know, the baseline of the system is, is a strong KYC uh, mechanism mm -hmm. when you're signing up to make sure that you are who you are and to make sure that you are uh, of a certain age and you meet certain requirements that are, that are you know, the standard for, for that, for that uh, location or geography. Um, 
for example, um, right now we are partnering with uh, two important technology partners who uh, kind of solve that problem uh, with us for the video gaming space. And we're doing, making a lot of innovations there. Um, none of the kind of video game uh, wagering or kind of wagering adjacent companies uh, have tackled this problem because it's actually quite a challenging problem and sure. requires a lot of work on the, on the regulatory side. Um, uh, but we're working with a company called Comtrade, which is one of the leaders in back office solutions. You can imagine how complicated it is to make sure that users are, are appropriately bucketed into different jurisdictions and markets sure. mm -hmm. where their transactions may be uh, taxed at different rates, where each jurisdiction will have different things that you're supposed to keep track of. And then each jurisdiction will have their, you know, set of regulators will have their own access requirements. So Comtrade, you know, is our partner building uh, uh, together the, the back office that makes most sense and is optimized to a video gaming experience uh, and not just, you know, say an online poker, online slot experience. Um, the other partner that we're working with is uh, LexisNexis. Oh, sure. And so, you know, a lot of, you know, I, until I dipped my toe in this space, LexisNexis was well known to me from my days in grad school as kind of a research tool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is back in the day, but they they've expanded their business in really interesting and important ways, and, and they're, they're now uh, you know, huge. They're, they're number the, they're the, the one of the number one global um, providers for for data, um, and uh, we're working with them to provide KYC uh, and geolocation, which we've actually developed uh, together with them, and we're going through certification and approvals together. Um, and uh, kind of the most exciting piece of it that we've worked on together is uh, their biometric KYC system. And so you can imagine a biometric system you know, like the kind you see in, uh, in spy movies or James Bond, where you, know, you put your eye against something that reads your retina, or you, um, you, know, you use your fingerprint or something like that, or face ID. Uh, this is slightly different from that. So the idea is that um, the system creates kind of a behavioral uh, fingerprint. And so uh, you can imagine, for example, signing up and the system will keep track and, and record kind of whether you swipe typically from right to left. You know, it'll use the gyroscope to understand what angle you typically hold the phone at or how strong you are to move it so that if a kid picks it up, they might have a smaller finger. They might swipe it. You know, your kid, my kid's 15. He might swipe from right to left. He might use two fingers, hold it in his right hand, et cetera. So all of these kind of behavioral things uh, are, are used to create a kind of biometric signature. Uh, in a very secure way, you can't backwards engineer from the signature to find out who, you know, what, what specific behaviors there were. But it's just created by the biometric signature. And so it means that there's an added layer of KYC authentication. Sure. That we uh, have built into the platform with LexisNexis. So these are kind of very important technology points. Man, I find that that's fascinating and scary at the same time. Go ahead, yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's actually very interesting from my perspective because, especially from a capital markets perspective and from a regulatory perspective, those are the same type of controls that are, you know, uh, established for the security of a lot, of, either from a buy side or a sell side. You know, if you're playing around with securities and trading financial instruments, there's a huge KYC and AML component down to the geographical location and jurisdictions and the local securities regulatory, uh, regulatory bodies that establish those frameworks for their countries. That that whole concept is also here applied in the gaming uh, side of things. And that's really awesome to see, especially since we're dealing with potentially um, users that aren't the most well-informed in terms of what they are potentially transacting with our actual uh, potential. Would they be considered classified in what we call from a financial perspective, securities in themselves, these digital assets that, you know, eventually create appreciable value or that they are able to wager no, against? No, they wouldn't. So, so the idea is that the transactions are um, cash transactions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't appreciate you know, I, I don't know how to what analogy is best, but it's like a, a almost like a spot market that clears immediately. Mm, okay, um, yeah. yeah. Maybe that's not the best analogy. You know, my background isn't in fintech, but um, you know, it, it's what, what's important for us as you know, 
after my time in Korea, you know, uh, had a game studio with, with the, the CEO of, of, uh, of G3, you know, our, our background goes, you know, I think maybe 15 years now, but we had a game studio together. We sold to Disney. Um, we were at Disney for a while and then we did a right. nonprofit, uh, game publishing, well, game pub publishing effort. Um, and then we kind of parted ways, but, um, and then came back together for this. Um, but when it comes to kind of the video game experience, you know, our vision wasn't originally to think deeply about platform. You know, this, this goes back to maybe 10, 15 years when we were just thinking about what's fun. And it never right. made sense to us that, you know, you have people buying these loot crates and these random item drops where they don't even know what they're going to get. Um, but there's no way to, and then all of the problems of how do you market games, you know, discovery was beginning to become a problem in the app store, et cetera. And of course, for big, uh, AAA games, you know, um, uh, you know, converting people to purchase was always a big marketing push. Um, and we were, especially in the mobile gaming space, we were always confronted by the problem. Look, it would be great to be able to just pay people money, right? So that, you know, if they, they make certain effort inside the game or help beta test certain things uh, to be able to just give them real consideration. Uh, and then another, uh, just one step away from that is, you know, when someone buys a loot crate, why not occasionally let them win five or 10 or a hundred bucks, you know? And of course we knew that the reason was regulation and this falls under the jurisdiction of wagering, but it felt like something that, you know, video games and the video game kind of uh, uh, um, engagement cycle uh, was it felt like something that was very native to that kind of an engagement cycle. So we've been thinking about the problem for a long time. What actually happened for G3 is very funny. You know, um, it's never a good idea. I'm sure everyone will agree to have a business plan where step one is to convince the legislators uh, of anything. You know, um, that's a non-starter. And so for a long time, we were just kind of thinking about the problem and it's really just became a, a passion project and something that we just kept scratching our heads at. You know, we weren't really sure why it was happening. Um, about two or three years ago, uh, the DGE um, approached, you know, uh, our founder, uh, Anthony, one of, one of our two founders, um, and asked for... Uh, help with thinking about the gaming space or the video game space as it might apply to uh, wagering in New Jersey. And so oh. uh, it was a very important kind of milestone for us. You know, it looked like there was a convergence that was going to happen very quickly. And so we made the decision really to think hard about, well, what, what would be needed from the regulatory side to kind of unlock these wagering experiences, again, for the in a safe way for the right age groups, in the millennial and Gen Z generation, uh, you know, what would be, what would it take? And we realized very quickly that it would take a platform that was designed from the ground up to be fully compliant with regulations across jurisdictions. You know, some jurisdictions even have local hosting requirements. Yeah, so, sure. so, you know, just like FinTech, right? And so, or even video games or, or any website, you know, if you look at the EU for, for how warehousing, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, right. So, um, but then in, in, in the U.S., for example, in the wagering space, it's even more complicated because it's state by state. Right. And so we said, well, it looks like there are two big problems uh, that the video game industry uh, has, has kind of faced, you know, and where it makes the investment of time uh, maybe not worth it, where the ROI is uncertain, et cetera. The two problems were, um, number one, on the... Um, uh, with the problem of, is it clear exactly what types of features are um, quote unquote legal under existing regulations? Mm -hmm. And that was something that would require a lot of discovery and work talking to different states. The states were not really focused on video games. You know, it was one of those things where it, it didn't really make sense to drill down into all the different models at that time. Um, and then the other one was, you know, when it comes to actually kinds of, kind of backwards engineering products, so that they become compliant in some way. Uh, it was, um, you know, that's a daunting task in and of itself. If you have a, have a user base of, you know, millions of players um, who span the gamut of different ages, let's say 13 and over, you know, how would you even backwards engineer that to bring these kinds of experiences to them in a safe and regulated way? You know, it was one of those things where it didn't really, the activation energy or the hurling threshold for, for the gaming industry, video game industry wasn't really uh, very easy to achieve. 
So we looked at the situation and we said, let's create G3 so that it solves those problems. You know, of course, um, th there'd be two important components. One is to make sure that we are helping the on the regulation and the re legislative side continue to converge uh, uh, in terms of the right approach and the right guidelines and standards to be applying. Um, and then the other, the other side, of course, was uh, reaching clarity when it came to the types of feature sets that would be available to um, to the video game industry, you know, not just to users, but also to publishers and game developers. You know, maybe it would be interesting. Uh, I, I, maybe I could share some of our perspective on um, the types of models that are out there. Yeah, yeah no, and, and I think that's super interesting. Um, you know, most of these, I would imagine, and you cor can correct me if I'm wrong, but again, if I'm putting on, you know, what I understand from a, a financial institution perspective with regulation and securities, you know, if you're, let's say, wanting to trade or enter uh, a, a market to trade certain securities for a certain geography, you have to go and secure that license yourself, or you go and pay a licensing fee to a platform that has already secured that. Uh, securities license to be able to transact and be the execution venue on behalf of you. So is is G3 here kind of taking that model that financial institutions have been leveraging for the past 20 years now, especially in high frequency trading, but to the gaming industry where G3 is a platform to be a regulatory compliant platform for any video game publisher to be able to uh, um, address money wagering or any sort of cash transaction in a regulatory compliant way. Like, let's say I'm the creator of League of Legends and I don't have a securities license, but I want to go and spin up loot boxes uh, to create some real in time cash incentivization for my users. Do I then go and um, you know, basically become a customer of G3? You have the capabilities, you've already uh, partnered with these regulators, you have regulatory clearance, compliance, to say, let's transact in New Jersey for users there. Now, I, League of Legends, am leveraging the G3 platform, and now I can create uh, regulatory compliant loot boxes for my users in New Jersey. Am I understanding that correctly, or, or are, am I a little are, bit off the maybe mark? We can start, maybe we can start with the analogy, which is you know, the, my understanding of, of how you know, fintech in, in that space kind of would work is you, know, you could try to get, get licensed and do all that stuff and become an operator directly, or you could take your product and find ways to plug it into existing operators or folks that are licensed, right? So, so different, different uh, investment instruments or, or, or whatever. Um, it's a great analogy because the vision or the long-term is for people who have game content, you know, games, to have a very simple way just to plug their game in to the platform and then be able to address, you know, let's say um, in general, the age group is uh, over 20, let's say, uh, on average. They would be able to address the uh, that market and sign them up and go through KYC and all of that and immediately unlock these kinds of experiences for them. Um, so you could imagine in an LOL kind of situation, you could imagine people who... Um, would like to wager on themselves or their team beating another team. Or you could imagine people wanting to wager on um, a live stream of a, of, a, of, a, of a conference or league fixture, you know. Um, but even more simply, we think that there's a huge market that people are not really um, aware of when it comes to bringing simpler games to this space, you know, um, and, and games that do appeal to kind of millennials and, and Gen Z or older, you know, that aren't like kids' games per se, you could imagine Candy Crush uh, just killing it, right? Um, maybe if I could just um, delve briefly into the, so the, the actual models, right? Um, there's the idea of tournament or skill-based competition or kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer wagering when you kind of, you know, the two of you kind of wager on uh, who's going to win, you know? And it's kind of similar in concept to the poker model where you come in and you, you put down a wager and there's a there's some sort of a, a pool and the winner or top two or three will, will split the pool in, in some way. Um, so there's that kind of competitive model. And you see different companies addressing it in different ways. And even technically speaking, uh, offline tournaments fall under this model as well, right? Mm. Um, and then you have kind of the random jackpot model, which is more like a slots model. 
Um, and this clearly falls under the purview of wagering. You know, there are some companies out there who assert that skill-based wagering or skill-based kind of competitive experiences don't fall under the purview of wagering legislation. Um, but that's something that, uh, you know, we, we think is more of a gray market and will be clarified very soon by regulators around the world and around the U.S. Um, but again, here's one model that falls directly under the purview of wagering is obviously these kind of random skill-based jackpots, uh, you know, with kind of a progressive mechanism put into it, you know, like slot machines. And so the best analogy I can have for video games, how it would be game changing is if you could imagine playing Pac-Man, you know, it could be against someone, you have some sort of a, a competitive pot, that's fine, but you're playing Pac-Man and every once in a while, when you eat the red ghost, you have a chance to win $10,000. You know, it feels like that would add a lot of fun to a Pac-Man game, you know? Um, yeah. Right. And, and it, and it's not, it doesn't feel like you're wagering. Like you're not, and I don't mean to be, um, I'm not being disingenuous. I feel like the concept of, of jackpots being added to games isn't always necessarily in a wagering framework per se, even the regulatorily, it would be regulated as wagering, you know, that just feels like, you know, being a fun little extra enhancement to the experience. Um, another important thing about millennials and Gen Z is that they're used to subbing to their favorite influencers or creators or subbing to support content, uh, um, you know, and, and, and in a way that that's almost like you could imagine you're paying you know, these tokens or whatever uh, uh, every time you play or every hundred plays or, you know, every month you, you're paying about five bucks in tokens, right? Just to have the experience and enjoy it. And, uh, in return, you're, you have these awesome experiences where every once in a while when you eat a ghost or you kill a thing or something drops, you know, you hear on Twitter or whatever, you know, someone just won $10,000. Like it would just be fun, you know? Right. So um, the idea of somehow adding random jackpots to a video game experience is really important in our view. And we think it is one of the linchpins of the differentiation between operating and kind of the regulated market versus you know, what, what's occurring right now in the gray market. So in addition to competitive stuff, you have the jackpots. And kind of the third uh, model is a model that we call watch and wager. And we're really trying to leverage the way millennials and Gen Z and other audiences who enjoy live streaming have been uh, participating and interacting over live streams, uh, you know, for the past few years, you know, as, as Twitch has blown up. Oh, um, man, I that that's I have two things I want to react to you real quick here. Yeah, I mean, and, and I want yeah, to talk through like a very conceptual exercise here. So, you know, this isn't real or anything, but the way I'm understanding it, for example, and let's use an example like Call of Duty, since almost everyone that is listening and everyone knows how Call of Duty works at some point. But, you know, let's say you're you're playing a, a, a team deathmatch, for example, online. And you're earning these points for your kill streak, right? And you earn X amount of kills in a row and, uh, you know, you unlock certain perks. So in theory, and, and probably why this doesn't exist today, because Call of Duty is not a regulated uh, game, they don't have licenses or anything. But in theory, what you're saying is, like, let's say I hit a 12, 12, uh, 12 kill streak. I get 12 kills in a row and I unlock a perk that is a random, uh, let's say, lottery or jackpot perk. And I go and I use all of my, uh, I unlock that perk. I use my kill streak to unlock that perk. And then I go and run it and it randomly generates, you know, uh, a lottery or a jackpot. And, you know, by chance I land and maybe I could win a thousand dollars. Uh, are you saying that, 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 it, that concept in theory could be, uh, uh, established here in the future with a regulated gaming, uh, purview? Am I understanding that correctly? Absolutely, because the, the thing that's keeping it from being done right now is the fact that um, there's no way to do it in a compliant way, right? Man, the, imagine the, how the, many video games, how many kids. Yeah. I mean, I think of all of well, the video kids, games. But I want to be one. very clear. Well, the quarter platform is, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is specifically yeah. designed to keep kids safe, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but right. but think of the amount of hours people pour into video games. Think of Pokemon right. Gold and Pokemon Yellow and Pokemon Red early. Think about Call of Duty and and young adults, college kids, you know, millennials, 20 years to 40 years old spending 12, 15, 20 hours a week and all they have to show for it is within their these gaming platform walled gardens 
certain skins or certain assets, right? And, you know, how they get some social clout or social reputation is, oh, that guy has this high unachievable skin on his gun. And that means that he's a really good shooter. But now, you know, I've been spending 12 hours a week playing this game and I'm actually earning money because I'm ran, I'm, uh, the game is licensed appropriately to actually go and distribute, you know, cash models or cash winnings that, that, I mean, think of how many video gaming platforms would just immediately consume so many more users. Re- people love money. People want to earn money for their time. You know, time for money is is the the the, the oldest you know bartering transaction system on, in in human society. And now you're saying you know maybe in the future future there is a purview where I could earn real money because I'm devoting enough time into this video games and it's actually generating me some sort of reward or cash back. That's crazy. Sure, but but it would be it would again be inside a framework of, um, you know, some sort of a wagering type of framework, right? Mm. So the idea of really being able to earn an income from it, unless you're entering tournaments and you're just way better than people like Magnus Carlson. If, if, if chess.com was using our platform to run tournaments, you know, you're Magnus Carlson, you're going to make a good income. You know, if I'm not gonna but, can, yeah. can you talk to us a little bit about how brands are associating or seeing this space? Um, I see this as a great opportunity for uh, a new form of advertising. And can perhaps you can talk a little bit about the possibilities here with um, with major brands being associated with, you know, this jackpot type of structure. Maybe they're sponsoring the $10,000 jackpot winning. And that is a new form of reaching uh, a totally new different demographic. Yeah, I think that the, that's exactly right. I mean, there's, there's a certain kind of, so, so the idea of earning an income by playing, I think that's something that's a deeper issue that we should talk about. Sure. Um, because I think that the, you know, the big, no one should go to a casino or, or do these yeah. kinds of things. Yeah, <laughs> expect them to win. Well, we get, yeah. <laughs> this, this is not financial advice on this. Yeah, not a financial advice. <laughs> We're not so supporting this. The idea either. is that, you know, you, you, you basically come out ahead as long as you have a good time and right. you, you know, pay the, whatever the, 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 the rake or the vig is for, for the experience, you know, and, and, and on your wages, you kind of break even, you know, so you, you are, it's like watching a movie, you know, you, you, you wager a hundred bucks, maybe you end up losing 10 bucks, you know, that, that's kind of the balance, right? Sure. Um, where, um, uh, so I just wanted to make sure that I, <laughs> I made that statement, but also, yeah, Thank you. Uh, in, in the long term, when you think about it, um, and again, this is about the, just what does being regulated enable, right? And it mm-hmm. enables, first of all, bringing skill-based com- com- competition and these kinds of semi-wagering or wagering experiences into the white market, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which is very difficult to backwards engineer, um, but it also gives you these random jackpot kind of mechanics, right? Similar sure. to slots. And you know, um, a lot of the devil is in the details. So what I'm, sp- going to describe is, is just conceptual. You know, a lot of it has to do with actually sitting down with regulators and talking about specific mechanics and then tweaking them to make sure that they're compliant, et cetera. But generally speaking, like you could imagine, yeah, absolutely. You have, here's another way to think about it. Um, let's say that there's a, um, we're all playing a, a Candy Crush, right? And uh, there's a mechanism so that every 10 games we play costs about a buck. And 10 cents out of each buck goes to a progressive jackpot. Sure. And over time in the odds, and there'd be a strict odds table, again, fully regulated, regulatorily compliant. You know, there are very strict standards about how you do this in a fair and, and transparent way to users. But you can imagine just what we're trying to do is substitute or swap out, you know, a slot machine or a casino you know, video game, right? For all these other video games, right? And so if you like Candy Crush and you have this opportunity and you're, and you spend, you know, you're spending money in their kind of free to play or slightly pay to win, you know, when you buy certain upgrades or you, you, you know, unlock things, um, right. uh, uh, you know, instead of monetizing it that way, you know, you just pay a, a direct thing and then and you could, you could monetize, you know, when you just, when you clear th- five donuts or whatever you, you, oh my gosh, I, I, I won $1 sometimes and $10, sometimes a thousand dollars, you know, yeah. and then, so there would that, be that progressive mechanism, but to be able to tie promotions or, or, or sponsors to that kind of a mechanism as well, I think it, it's potentially game changing. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to be careful not to oversell kind of, you know, these, these, these future ideas, 
Sure. But uh, it's, I think it's clear to anyone who's played video games and has experienced the thrill of even a non-monetary, um, some sort of drop or something and a benefit, right. um, will understand how fun it could be. Um, if I could just briefly go back to the watch and wager point, though. Yeah, so yeah. Us there is, you know, there are already esports uh, wagering efforts, right? A lot of um, uh, uh, online sportsbook operators have built out these esports extensions. And part of the reason why it's not growing as much as people expect or had hoped for is because there aren't enough, there isn't enough esports content per se. Mm. And that's because the wagering model, the fixed odds models, um, and, and the way that these guys operate doesn't uh, enable them to leverage the millions of hours of kind of gaming-related streamed content that's out there. And they have to focus on a, a you know, much smaller calendar of these, of these esports fixtures, these big competitions. Um, and there's not enough competitions, number one. And number two, they don't have enough uh, re- kind of regular season games. You know, I forget when, when I was a kid, the NFL only had like 12 or 13 games. Now they have 16 or whatever. Uh, the NBA has so many games. Baseball has, you know, it, it's, it's not even comparable, right? right? And so that's part of the reason why esports wagering may not be taking off. But we think that there's a deeper reason as well which is that millennials, in our opinion, millennials and Gen Z don't uh, look at wagering the same way. They look at it as a social interaction. It's not about sure. optimizing on a spreadsheet and trying to beat the odds or be smarter than the system or the market. You know, I mean, there's always going to be folks who enjoy that, right? But we're talking about a different type of experience where it's more social and it's about um, interacting, et cetera. And so we think that um, these fixed odds models for um Millennials and, and Gen Z, yes, it'll be appeal to some of them, but not as many as before. Traditional sports is not as interesting as it has been to, to previous generations to this, this generation, and, and increasingly so. And you have this this huge culture that I think that the, the industry hasn't fully understood its impact. This huge culture of uh, subbing and tipping and supporting, you know, content and, and creators on Twitch. And so we think that, you know, there are wagering models that you can bring to bear that are more uh, native to that experience um, where you have, you know, the audience given the opportunity to um, bet on propositions during the live stream. So it's like real time. Interesting. Sure. So Man, that's, that's awesome. I mean, think of like some of the largest YouTube streamers or Twitch streamers that have, you know, 500 K eyeballs watching their live stream, or, you know, there's a big example last year when Drake, you know, hopped on a live stream and all of a sudden Twitch's servers went down. Right. And yeah, I mean, do you, you know, remember if, about four years ago or three years ago when Drake, you know, um, got like 600 K, uh, concurrent viewers with Ninja for a, by yeah, hopping on yeah, 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 yeah. Um, at the time, uh, I was with Allied Esports. You know, that was a company that uh, an old friend of mine and I um, uh, um, listed on the NASDAQ as Allied Esports. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, formerly it was assets that were held by our game. It included the World Poker Tour. Yes. So, very, you know, that was kind of mm-hmm. a lot of my experience in, 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 in wagering as well. And then also kind of the esports efforts of the parent company. And so we listed that. And very soon after the Ninja Drake, um, uh, stream happened. We did a, a, a big show with with Ninja at our flagship arena in Las Vegas, and right. it was kind of uh, really groundbreaking in a lot of ways. It was about six or seven hours. You know, on average, we had maybe four hundred, four hundred fifty thousand uh, viewers. They were watching for at least an hour, typically. And at our peak, we actually broke Drake and Ninja, the the Drake's record that he had for those thirty minutes. So instead of say, I forget, maybe six hundred and twenty thousand, we had six hundred and sixty or seventy. So we were very proud of that. But the upshot of it is, is we've had we had these hundreds of thousands of viewers watching, and the entire format of our show was designed again. It wasn't a tournament. It was designed to be able to tell a story where people could follow the narrative of being Ninja or beating beating Ninja. And so in addition to, you know, some, some prizes being given to people who um, uh, uh, might win at specific rounds in Fortnite, um, there was also the 
there was a, also a bounty on Ninja. So any given round, you could be rooting for Ninja to win, but also rooting for him to survive, you know, being hunted oh, by all the other players on the server, right? And the bounty mechanism was actually something that we uh, imported over from the World Poker Tour. You know, um, the idea of bounties for these celebrity or, or really famous poker players is something that came from the, the poker tournament world. But you can see how when you have uh, a streamed broadcast of a, of a server that starts with hundreds of people or a hundred people anyway for Fortnite or PUBG or whatever, and trying to tell a coherent story, unless you have some uh, narrative mechanism and, and premise, it's very hard to do. It was super exciting because we had the bounty and we were able to follow Ninja around, et cetera, et cetera. But the important thing here for this story is that in the course of the six hours, there was so much demand and so much trash talk and so much of people making predictions uh, of those 400 to 650,000 people every hour, continuously in the channel, chatting, we knew that there was a huge uh, kind of un unmet demand for that kind of interactivity. And so just fast forwarding today, you know, focusing on what does Quarter allow, um, because of the way Quarter is, uh, the Quarter platform, that's the name of our platform, QRTR. Um, right. the, the, it, it's architected in a way that makes, first of all, these uh, uh, kind of random jackpot types of experiences, um, uh, white market. And it also makes it possible to, to implement these kind of real time, uh, propositional betting, you know, pari mutual betting over any live stream. You know, you could be betting whether mm. Ninja is wearing white underwear or black underwear, Brock boxers, briefs, Brock, he likes broccoli or spinach. At the end of the stream, he just tells you. And that's something that people have, have taken a position on, right? You know, it can be done that's, for points. That's insane. That's, yeah. that's crazy. I mean, just, I mean, the, the potential of this is kind of, Limitless. I mean, think think of if if both of you were live streamers competing against each other. You know, let, let's say in a Madden NFL game live stream, and you know, people at the beginning projected, "Hey, I think David is going to put 400 yards of offense on Abe's uh, on against Abe's team, but Abe is going to win by a point differential of seven points." And then, you know, the end results of that game, everyone that has placed their position could eventually win something out of that that jackpot. That's 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 something that is not achievable today. And think of how that could be applied to almost every video game with uh, your platform well, yeah, almost technology every, every and being screen, in a, right? Yeah, but yeah. the problem yeah. here is, yeah. isn't uh, the and it doesn't have to be esports or video games either. It could be anything, right? Um, is Abe wearing anything? Uh, long yeah. pants or short pants? At the end of the stream, he stands up and shows us his pants. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, but the important thing here is, you know, the technology isn't complex. The difficult part is all of the backend stuff, right? Making sure. sure that all the users who are participating are operating in a safe walled garden in a way that's transparent. You have to have, have systems in place um, to make sure that streamers aren't colluding. You have to have mm -hmm. a way for the operator to be um, putting up these propositions in real time for people to take a position on um, in a way that isn't manipulable and that's transparent to regulators as well. You know, these, this is the kind of heavy lifting, again, similar to putting jackpots, random jackpots into video games that the market has had a hard time kind of overcoming. And really it's because, and we would never have undertook it, undertaken it unless uh, regulators hadn't come to us first and said, we think that the market's here. Let's get ready for it together in some way. Man, this is just awesome. I mean, we're talking through so many different use cases of, you know, that could be applied in actual, not in, not only video games, but a lot of social engagement that all of us uh, are interacting in today. Um, so, so you know, my, my gut reaction to this is, why is it taking so long to get to this point? Uh, I mean, it, it sounds like, at least in theory, the technology has always been there. But, you know, I just heard from you at the, earlier on this session that, you know, you're using someone like LexisNexis, some uh, a tool that all of us are used to from a college perspective and from a legal perspective being a, a very powerful uh, research uh, database, right, that we can go and look. So it sounds like you've got some unique technology partners here that are really making what Quarter is developing uh, and come to fruition here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we do have a lot of ecosystem partners as well in the world of the uh, video game publishing, video game studios, uh, esports organizations, and and kind of uh, the industry associations. So there's that whole ecosystem side. But I would like to really focus on, as you mentioned, on, on the technology partners and the partners that are making this actually possible, right? 
um, you know, not filling the pipeline, but, you know, that actually make the platform possible. And so, you know, um, there's a, the technology component. Um, you can think of kind of four main areas, right? Uh, the first is, you know, our, our partnership with uh, AWS. You know, they have spearheaded an effort uh, to develop kind of on-premises hosting solutions as well. You know, they, of course, they're famous for the cloud, but in, for certain types of regulated markets, there is an on-premises requirement. Yeah. And so this yeah. is something that they've developed and they're developing, I'm sure, for fintech, et cetera. With us, they're developing the, the solution for, um, uh, to be certified for real money video gaming, first in New Jersey, and then, of course, we'll bring it to other markets as well. So this is kind of the on-premises solution. You know, it's a, it, there are lots of things about how you do it that are very non-trivial. And it's one of those things where, you know, you can imagine a, a, a company, a startup trying to dog food it or, 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 you know, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps to do it. But you're not going to be able to do it better than um, Amazon. And, uh, you know, we're very grateful for the time and, and, and support that they've invested into working with us. Um, another important partner, again, LexisNexis we talked about. And of course, as a KYC provider um, and and uh, AML, you know, helping with AML and, and all of those kinds of things, they're invaluable, and they're you know one of the t- already one of the top in the in the in the global across global industries, right? But specifically for video gaming, um, you know, and and uh, in mobile and PC devices, working on pieces like geolocation and uh, uh, biometric, you know, KYC are, are super important. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, actually managed to, uh, finish our work with a geolocation solution that works very well and that, that we're, we've gotten through certification together with LexisNexis. You know, we, um, have developed with LexisNexis the biometric, um, authentication side. Uh, that's kind of optimized for the way we're going to use it for quarter and for, for real money video gaming. So that's very, very important. And again, it's one of those situations where could you imagine, a startup that was trying to do um, uh, real money video gaming as kind of a gleam in their eye or a vision to, to pursue that, uh, really being able to do better than LexisNexis in these areas, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine. Um, the other two partners, again, I've already mentioned Comtrade, which is kind of the back office partner, and they've been, uh, you know, at the forefront of kind of back office solutions for iGaming. Mm-hmm. And so we've been, work, you know, around the world. And so we've been working with them to to make sure that that we can develop an, uh, a system that's optimized, not just for quarter, but for real money video gaming writ large. Um, and so that's very important. And again, because, you know, even back office systems, it's not just a simple database of users and, and transaction uh, uh, tracking. The mm-hmm. problem is that each jurisdiction has to have for um uh, you know, full visibility into what, into the user base and, and what you're tracking and, and certain things, uh, in real time. So real time transparency. And again, and different jurisdictions will have different requirements. Sure. And so it, th- that's what makes the, the problem non trivial. And we're, we're very grateful to be working with Comtrade. Um, finally, as a tech partner, we're working with Continent 8, which is one of the Good. premier kind of hosting and co-location, secure co-location providers. Uh, they already, uh, are at the forefront of uh, providing those services for casinos and online casinos already. And so we're very grateful to have them as a partner. And we've been working with them on certain solutions to uh, kind of balance latency, you know, which can be important for certain types of video game play, sure. um, as well as for um, ways to uh, analyze packets uh, that go through the pipes to see if there's certain types of cheating happening, like bots and things like that. Right. So working on, on that stuff with continuity is really great. Um, a, a last partner that's making the, 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 the platform possible, of course, is, is GLI. Um, um, sure. We're working through certifications with them. And, uh, you know, we've been uh, very fortunate to be featured by them as one of their um, technologies to watch for in the future at their recent uh, regulators conference. And we look forward to working with them to further solidify kind of standards around the industry and to be able to speak with regulators um, uh, to make sure that that regulations are, are uh, and, and standards are created or clarified in a way that sure. will make sure the ecosystem continues to grow. So those are kind of very important pieces. And um, if there's just one last thing I could say about those those um, partners or parties is that, um, you know, by our estimate, we can't imagine... Uh, you know, even if, if, if we were starting from scratch today, 
Um, we couldn't imagine doing it without those partners and trying to hit the same level of kind of robust service level or, or um, reliability uh, on our own. Uh, because how could you beat a solution that would beat those guys in any of those verticals? And also, um, we think that it would, uh, even working with them, it would still take, you know, 18 months or so to build it from scratch. So we're, we're very comfortable in kind of where we are in terms of our, our platform development roadmap. Well, Dave, I mean, it, it sounds like, again, you know, from a, from what I know from a financial institution, you've almost married all of the capabilities that you need to have a regulated financial market. You know, you've chosen hand selected these partners to take that same approach here for a regulated gaming market. But it sounds like the quarter platform, at least the way it's forming in my, my head here, and we're talking about very specific to the gaming industry, this platform capability and what you're bringing to market could be applicable not only just specific to the gaming industry, but other industries. Where, where do you see this kind of taking, taking shape and form of other industries that can start to uh, harness the power of, of the quarter platform, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, you can think of the quarter platform as doing a, a few things, right? Number one is to make sure that folks are old enough, whatever that means for, for whatever industry or state, for, for whichever type of video game, but old enough to engage in the experience. The other thing is to make sure that you are who you are, right? And so it goes through kind of standard KYC methods and then also has the added layer of biometric uh, authentication or KYC. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, and then on the back of that, we have all the stuff that, that's related to wagering. So making sure that it's transparent to regulators. And these are kind of general uh, value propositions that we think translate to ac across a number of industries. You know, I'm sure it's already being done in finance, you know, in, in fintech. But we think that when it comes to video games and wagering experiences uh, for for kind of millennials and Gen Z, you know, it, it's it's something it's a need that had to be met. And we've invested the time to kind of meet it. When we're looking at kind of other use cases, well, you could think about or other other industries that it could be applied to. Um, maybe the easiest kind of extension is to think about how it could apply maybe to uh, Web3 in some ways, right? And so uh, on our roadmap is uh, building kind of a, uh, you know, backstopping our current platform with a crypto cryptographically kind of secure uh, uh, a database as well, you know, um, probably in some sort of a blockchain application. But whether it's, you know, whether it would be centralized or decentralized, that's something really that regulators would decide. But the idea is to have something that's indelible and cryptographically secure and anonymous to a certain extent that would be accessible not just by regulators, but also accessible by, uh, you know, um, other operators like, like casino partners. So you could imagine in the future going up to, you know, you've just won a thousand dollars at blackjack or something at Caesars. You have your phone, you know, you have your ID and your whatever fingerprint that confirms it's you. And then they scan the QR code and you're done, you know, and, and in a way that's fully transparent to regulators. Um, uh, the casino would be able to tell who you are, but also to see if you're a bad actor, you know, what your, what your kind of pattern of, of wagering has been. Not from a perspective of kind of um, uh, snooping on your privacy, but just to make sure that you, oh, you don't have any patterns that uh, conform to possible money laundering and things like that. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, that's kind of the next use case is, is trying to find ways to extend it um, for the same group of regulators, maybe, to other types of operators, including brick and mortar. Sure. But once you start thinking about it that way, there's no reason why you, it couldn't be used in other ways, right? So once you have a mobile form, form factor like the phone and you're walking from place to place, it could be, well, it's true that a lot of banking is increasingly done online, but there's certain things that might be done in person um, and where it could be some aspect of the platform or some application of it could be used for... Uh, to authenticate who you are at a, at a bank or in some other kind of context. So we're very excited about the future of the platform and the fact that it is a mobile form factor, the fact that it's not intrusive in common, commonly um, worried about ways, uh, you know, and uh, that you can't kind of backwards engineer someone's personal data from their, um, you know, from their signature, so to speak. Uh, and so, so we're just very excited about those, those applications. On the flip side, we could also think about what is it, you know, um, for example, there's, there was a lot of, uh, hype and interest in kind of 
blockchain related video game developments in the future and and in the past actually right so play to earn was very interesting nfts were very interesting and you know you could imagine as these kinds of things become more mainstream they're not quite there yet but as they become more mainstream and kind of more again not necessarily gray market or extra market activities but uh, brought into the white market um, regulators are going to want to have a transparent way to see what's going on there as well and we are convinced that whether it's in the specific technology of an NFT on the blockchain or some other method, that the idea of having transferable assets that you've invested time into and built value into, being able to be transferred in kind of a, a very secure and uh, predictable and rateable way um, uh, between, between users is going to be very important. And again, the most recent way people have done it is with NFTs, with all its attendant um, positive aspects and, and, and also the concerns. Um, but again, regardless of how that stuff shakes out, we are very confident that our platform is going to be situated in a, in a position where we can just turn, flip the switch and be able to make all of those things uh, possible uh, in, a, in a compliant, fully compliant way. Um, and then kind of long term, you know, the question of play to earn video games, you know, um, it's, it's kind of experiencing some turbulence uh, right now. And, and there were a lot of problems with the model. Um, and a lot of it had to do with security and 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 users not being protected, right? right. And so uh, we think that there are lots of ways that, that the quarter platform would be able to address that aspect as well of kind of the latest kind of wave of crypto gaming, which had to do with play to earn. Man, th this is this has been probably one of the most informative podcasts we've recorded and I've been a part of. I mean, I... I, I tend to know a little bit about everything, but you just went into a whole subject area that I really didn't know too much, but uh, definitely uh, understand it now better, uh, especially in the way that you explained it. Uh, what, what you guys are developing is, is I, it's a huge uh, fulfillment of a gap right now in the market. Uh, and as uh, attention and consumer intention and user attention and gaming intention, you know, tends to just continue to grow and amplify here in the gaming side of things. And a lot of these technologies start to come to bear. You know, I think uh, especially what we're seeing, at least in the Web3 space right now, regulators are paying more attention. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think especially from a Ywills perspective, we just are going to assume everything at some point is going to be treated as a security. And it seems what you guys have developed is already kind of taking that purview and saying, hey, if you if this is deemed as some sort of security, some sort of financial instrument, or the regulators are going to consider this, we have the platform that ensures that you can transact in this way and engage those users in a regulatory compliant way. And I mean, that's that's such a big win. That's I think you're decision. you're yeah. I mean, this could be applied to metaverse games. This could apply to fantasy sports, for example. This could be applied. Even on a nine gaming perspective, think about the massive influencer creator community, right? And creating robust followings there. Or think about from a D to C, B to C company perspective and potentially amplifying very powerful loyalty rewards programs and gamifying that and creating some brand stickiness and, um, you know, better customer retention and right. all that good stuff. Uh, now, now I'm kind of selling on behalf of you. Well, but no, no, thank, well, which I greatly appreciate. Thank you, Siva. But, um, uh, you hit the nail on the head because really the, the, the platform is designed to make all of these things possible. And what makes it possible is the fact that regulators are going to be able to see what's going on and it's going to be done securely and in a safe way for users. Really, that's what it is, mm -hmm. right? And I think that the two um, sectors that we've, been, we've kind of mentioned, you know, the, the video games, I'm sorry, the, the wagering, the real money uh, entertainment sector and the, the, the finance sector are the two most stringent. Right. If you have a solution that works for those regulators, you're going to, you know, you'll be able to apply it to other, other spaces. Exactly. Yeah. They solve, for the most, solve for the most complex product. And then you just captured the entire, everything that falls under that umbrella. Right. So this is awesome, David. And so I, I, again, thank you for, I, I had an hour of education here, free education. Usually I have to pay for something like this, uh, for someone like yourself, but th this was great. Uh, this, this conversation. So if, if I'm, if I'm interested in G3, how do I, how do I learn more? How do I get, who do I get in contact? Contact? How do we engage with you? Well, maybe we can we can include the the, the website uh, in the show notes, yep, we'll, right? We'll yeah, include all the we'll, we'll include all the well. the, the links yeah. uh, in the description. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that would be it would be great to hear from the uh, Y Whales and YPO community. Um, I've been 
adjacent to the to the community for a very long time. I have some friends who are members, right. and uh, it's just a real honor and, and, and a pleasure to to speak with you guys um, and be given the chance to address your amazing community. Uh, but also, uh, Abe and, and Siva, thank you so much for for giving me the the space and the runway to kind of ramble on about our product uh, in ways that I rarely get the the opportunity to do. Um, and you know, it was I, I could spend hours talking through use cases uh, with you because it's just so so much fun. But if there's just one thing I could leave listeners with about us and and our our platform is really the idea from the beginning was to build something that was fully compliant with regulatory standards in, in whichever jurisdictions we're, we're addressing, right, around the world and in each state in the U.S., so that uh, it makes possible the specific models that we talked about. You know, those three mm-hmm. use cases, which have to do with random jackpots, you know, skill-based uh, wagering and, and kind of watch and wager uh, in a fully compliant way. And, uh, and then also, of course, to have the relationships in the ecosystem to bring that about. But we really do believe that what we've done is going to serve the entire ecosystem. Uh, and, um, you know, we can't wait to see these different use cases uh, in users' hands. Uh, I'm great. especially personally excited about the watch and wager stuff because, uh, you know, it's I, I'm a fan of a lot of creators. Let's put it that way. That's awesome. David, it was not a ramble. It was an education. And that is yeah. one of our missions at Y Wales is we are here to educate as many people as possible. So it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on our podcast. And maybe we'll do a part two and follow up and see how regulation has changed. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a great idea. That's that's uh, that's awesome. Man, David, I mean, you're. I feel like you're living mine, Abe's, every millennial boy's dream that grew up yeah. playing video games and, you know, made their career in video games. And now you're pushing the the technical frontier and the regulatory frontier and overall narrative of gaming and, and how interwoven it's becoming as part of our society and yeah. uh, where it's going to eventually, you know, uh, 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 evolve what social engagement looks like and how uh, companies and how enterprises and how regulators and everyone can uh, should, should be paying more attention and should be t- right. speaking to individuals like yourself. So thank, thank you. you thank, so thank you. Thank you for time. the hour. This was a great education session for me. Yeah. Thanks David. Thank you. And if we ever do have occasion to do a part two, it would be great to touch on um, uh, some of the stuff we're, we're looking at for AI applications and things like that on the back end. Really exciting. Lots of other use cases to talk through. So thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. He's closing awesome. with the AI drop. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>